You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org, Medscape Cardiology. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape. You can now access the latest in medical news on your Amazon Alexa-enabled device. Join me, Perry Wilson, every weekday morning for Medscape Medical Minute, where I highlight the top medical stories of the day. To add Medscape Medical Minute to your flash briefing, search for Medscape Medical Minute on Amazon and click Enable. Or open the Amazon Alexa app, go to Skills, search for Medscape Medical Minute, and click Enable. Then say, Alexa, what's the news? Or, Alexa, what's my flash briefing? I hope you'll join us. Hi, everyone. This is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology, and this is This Week in Cardiology for May 20th, 2022. This week, ischemic versus anatomic testing for CAD, the UK TAVI trial, TAVI for aortic regurgitation, and post-PCI antithrombotic choices. First, today, an announcement. Next week is Memorial Day. And the Mandrola family is on holiday, so this week in cardiology will return to next week, June 3rd. First topic, stable coronary artery disease. Let's talk ischemic versus anatomical testing. In September 2021, the ischemia trial authors published a sub-analysis of the main trial looking at ischemic burden versus anatomic complexity in terms of prediction of future events and any effect on invasive versus conservative strategies. Now, this was a provocative paper on many levels. And this week, journalist Patrice Wenling reported on a letter from heart surgeons who found discrepancies between the number of patients in each anatomic severity group reported in the paper versus the numbers reported in the supplement. The surgeons found this issue early in April. They wrote a letter to Circulation, but the circulation editors decided not to publish it because it came after the six-week window. Now, a side note here. I think this six-week window for letters to the editors is kind of ridiculous. It's digital publishing. It ought to be a rolling window. Now, the authors say it's a formatting error, and to my eye, as of yesterday, when I looked at the paper, the supplement and paper now seem to correspond. But Patrice's coverage got me looking into this paper and the big idea of ischemic versus anatomic testing. Now, we are doing a ton more CTAs, and I'm not sure this is a good idea. Okay, let's go for some background. First, recall that the ischemia trial randomized more than 5,000 patients who had at least moderate ischemia and documented CAD by CTA to either an invasive or conservative revascularization strategy and you recall that there was no significant difference in the primary endpoint of CV death, MI, unstable angina, heart failure, or cardiac arrest. Now, I think the coolest thing about the ischemia trial was that these similar outcomes in hard endpoints were achieved despite the fact that only about 20% of the invasive arm ever got revascularization. Of course, this strongly supports the notion that stable CAD is highly stable and amenable to disease-modifying medical therapy. Okay, now to the paper. The authors of this new sub-analysis did two major things. First, they looked at how ischemic burden versus anatomic burden predicted events such as death, CV death, and MI in the future. Second thing, they evaluated whether ischemic burden or anatomic burden modified the treatment effect of either the invasive or delayed uh, strategies. Now, on the prediction front, the authors used mild ischemia as the comparator And they looked at how mild ischemia compared with moderate or severe ischemia for the prediction of future events. Now, you might wonder, wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought you had to have moderate to severe ischemia to get into the ischemia trial. So how are there mild ischemic cases? And this occurred because the site that randomized patients considered it moderate ischemia, but then the core lab at ischemia called it mild. This occurred in about 15% of patients. So this 15% was the control arm for the prediction. And what the authors found was that relative to mild ischemia, neither moderate ischemia nor severe ischemia was associated with an increased mortality. That's so interesting to me because we look at severe positive stress tests with a lot of fear. Now, it was different when they looked at anatomic complexity of CAD. Here, the authors separated the results of the CTA into six categories called the Modified Duke Prognostic Index. 
Again, they take the lowest severity as a control, which in this case was one vessel disease greater than a 50% lesion. And they found increasing CAD severity by anatomy was associated with a nearly threefold higher death rate and a nearly fourfold higher rate of MI for the most severe versus least severe CAD subgroup. Though I have to say these confidence intervals were very wide and got close to being non-significant. Okay, now the authors asked the question, did ischemic burden or anatomic severity modify the treatment effect of invasive or conservative strategies? Again, remember, there were no differences in the main trial, and nor was there a signal here. Ischemic severity did not identify a subgroup with treatment benefit on mortality, MI, the trial endpoint, or cardiovascular death or MI. Well, think about that when you send severely positive, high ischemic burden stress tests to the lab early. And then the most severe anatomic disease group, triple vessel disease with greater than 70% disease or double vessel disease with prox LED, the four-year all-cause mortality was also similar in the delayed and invasive subgroups. So my comments. First, the heart surgeons focus on this topic because they are rightly upset about the recent downgrade of bypass surgery in the severe anatomic category from grade 1 to 2B recommendations. And I struggle to understand why it was downgraded. Surely, it is not from the non-significant results of ischemia regarding the invasive approach. I say that because 20% of the invasive arm had surgical revascularization, but the vast majority of revascularization in ischemia was PCI, and there is no way to extrapolate findings from that small a subset of patients who had surgery. Now, you might push back and say, come on, Mandrola, this substudy you just covered found no benefit of invasive over conservative arm, even in those with the worst CAD. So maybe cabbage should be downgraded. And again, I'd say no, because most patients in ischemia were revascularized with PCI. And the subgroup of severe coronary disease only had 650 patients, which was only about 12% of the total cohort. And recall that PCI relieves obstructive lesions, but we don't know if they are the ones causing future event. Cabbage, on the other hand, as the editorialist write, could be considered coronary artery plaque bypassing surgery. That said, I would really love to see a new trial with modern medical therapy versus coronary artery bypass surgery, even in patients with left main disease, of course, stable patients. Medical therapy has improved a lot and it stabilizes all plaques. Okay, my second comment on this substudy relates to the discrepancies. The discrepancies that sat in a major journal for months. This I find problematic. Where was the vetting, the peer review, the editors? To me, this sort of thing is an argument for open data. Why would we not have journal publication contingent on release of the raw data, especially for this trial since ischemia was publicly funded? But surely open data is even more important for industry-sponsored studies. Consider for a second what a neutral Martian would say. A neutral Martian would come down and she would say, you're publishing science that will affect the care of millions of patients and no one else can see the raw data? Okay, third comment. Is ischemic testing dead as a predictor of events? Should we just forget about stress testing and go to anatomic imaging with CTA? As my friends from Edinburgh suggest in the accompanying editorial. And I would say no. I would say I respectfully disagree with my friends in Scotland. And here is why. In the editorial accompanying this substudy, Drs. Newby, Williams, and Dweck form an argument by saying that the ischemia substudy counters a courage substudy that found that PCI may be more beneficial in patients with high ischemic burden. Their argument goes like this. Unlike in courage, this substudy of ischemia did not find that ischemia predicted benefit of early intervention, nor did it find that ischemic burden even predicted events. They said anatomy looked better. But here's the first problem with their argument. That substudy of courage they cite, which tentatively suggested revascularization may have some benefit in those patients with high ischemic burden, actually, actually found no significant effect of PCI in high ischemic burden after adjustment for baseline differences. And I'll cite that paper in the show notes. The first author was Shaw's Circulation, 2008. 
Now, the other problem with the tenant that courage may have shown that PCI may offer benefit in patients with high ischemic burden is another sub-study from Courage, which found opposite results. The first author of that paper was also Shaw, American Heart Journal, 2012, quote, at baseline, moderate to severe ischemia occurred in more than one quarter of patients. Death or MI was similar, similar in those with moderate to severe ischemia, and there was no gradient increase in events for the overall cohort with the extent of ischemia. Now, the second problem with the newbie et al. argument is that they then cite two other trials, which they say back up the value of anatomic testing, PROMISE trial and Scott Hart. Now, I'm scratching my head because uh, PROMISE was non-significant, right? PROMISE was an RCT of functional stress testing versus CTA anatomy in patients with symptoms of CAD. The PROMISE was stone-cold negative. MACE occurred in 3.3% of the CTA group versus 3% in the functional stress test arm. How does this back up anatomy is better than ischemic testing? And as for citing Scott Hart, okay, you have to believe that an imaging test reduced major clinical outcomes by 40% when only a small fraction more patients in the CTA arm received statins and aspirin. I wrote a column explaining my concerns with Scott Hart back in 2018, and I'll cite that in the show notes. This ischemia substudy, therefore, does not, in my opinion, warrant favoring CTA over ischemic testing. I see CTA as having a role, for instance, in ruling out left main disease. But gosh, I wish you could simply block out all of the rest of the scan. And I say that because in the United States, the presence of significant disease often leads to the cascade of cath and revascularization. I know this may not be true in places like Columbia, but I'd estimate in 90% of America, cardiologists don't say, yep, you've got multivessel coronary disease. Here are some tablets. Positive CTAs go to the lab. And then from there, it is a short trip to a metal cage. Heck, in my zip code, it's not uncommon for my interventional colleagues to text me, hey, John, I did another cath for a positive CAC scan. So if CAC is driving angiography, then you know CTA will. Now, I know things may be different in Europe, different healthcare models, but my worry with CTA as a first test is finding incidental disease and overtreatment of CAD. Plus, as an electrophysiologist, I see tremendous value in the other things one gets from an exercise stress test, such as functional capacity and rhythm issues, for example. Okay, second topic, TAVR versus surgery, the UK TAVI trial. JAMA has published this large, pragmatic UK TAVI trial, TAVI versus surgery for patients with severe AS. This was a special and neat trial, 34 centers in the UK, 913 patients, and TAVI could be used any approved valve. The primary outcome was all-cause death at one year. This was a non-inferiority trial that used a risk difference of 5% for the non-inferiority margin. There were oodles of secondary endpoints. Before I tell you the results, a note on the patients and trial differences from the industry-sponsored balloon expandable and self-expanding TAVI trials. Every center that did TAVI in the UK were included as enrolling centers, and this was a publicly funded trial with very few exclusion criteria. The trial was conceived back in 2009, but things had changed over the decade forward, and patients in the trial were actually similar to those in the low-risk partner and evolute low-risk trial. So they were going to enroll high-risk patients, but things sort of changed. The median STS risk score in the UK trial was only 2.6, so the trial population would conventionally be classified as low surgical risk, even though the mean age was 81 years. Okay, now the results. At one year, there were 21 deaths, 4.6% in the TAVI group, 30 deaths, 6.6% in the surgery group. That's an adjusted absolute risk difference of minus 2%. So the upper bound or worst case scenario was only positive 1.2%, which was way less than the 5% non-inferiority margin. So TAVI easily met non-inferiority. Now the relative risk reduction The adjusted hazard ratio for death from any cause was 0.69, but had very broad confidence intervals from 0.38 to 1.26. Of the 30 pre-specified secondary outcomes reported, 24 showed no significant difference in one year. But stroke was nearly two times higher, and it nearly met statistical significance at a hazard ratio of 1.98. 
Tavi had fewer major bleeds, shorter hospital stay, but higher rates of pacemaker, more vascular complications, and more aortic insufficiency, exactly as you'd expect. So my comments first, you got to love the NHS for trials like this, pragmatic trials that have few exclusion criteria that include all implanting centers and any valve are valuable because they're generalizability, they have high external validity. So kudos to the authors here. Well, Dr. Sanjay Call sent a slide to our WhatsApp group that considered the pluses and minuses if 1,000 patients like those in the UK TAVI trial were treated with TAVI over surgery. So here's what you get. On the plus side of TAVI over surgery, you'd have 20 deaths prevented. That's 2% times 1,000. No, this is not significant for superiority. You'd have 130 fewer major bleeds. So 13% absolute risk difference times 1,000. You'd have shorter hospital stays and, of course, no sternotomy. But on the negative side, if 1,000 patients were treated with TAVI, you'd have 26 more strokes, 78 more vascular complications, 69 more pacemakers, and 283 more cases of mild to moderate aortic insufficiency. And finally, the main, the main limitation here is that this is one-year data. We know from the two-year Partner 3 data that early death advantages of TAVI lessen over time. My take on TAVI versus surgery remains the same. For high surgical risk patients with limited life expectancy or even intermediate risk patients, TAVI is a godsend. But for younger, lower risk patients, I just don't think we have enough long-term data yet. I totally understand that most patients want to avoid sternotomy, but I don't think we can discount the higher rates of AI, pacers, and vascular complications with TAVI. Okay, third topic is what about TAVI for aortic regurgitation? Now, it's fun to watch iterations. I've lived through so many iterations in cardiology. For years, we've been talking about TAVI only for AS, but at the EuroPCR meeting in Paris, we heard preliminary results of a single-arm feasibility study for TAVI for AI. It was only 45 older patients, 77 years, but patients had to have moderate to severe AI and a very high surgical risk. Half of them had an EF of 50% or less, and three-fourths had class 3 or 4 heart failure. And at discharge, the average aortic valve gradient was low, and the aortic valve area was large. No patient had moderate or severe paravalvular regurgitation, and 91% had no AR or just trace AR at discharge. But 23% of these patients got pacemakers. Patrice Wendling has great news coverage again, and we learned from her story that this particular valve system actually has CE mark in Europe. Now, this whole thing as a sidebar is CE mark is shocking to me that there's approval of this device with so little data. But again, it's just a different system of early approval in Europe. Perhaps some of my European colleagues can comment in the comments about how things get approved so quickly in Europe versus the U.S. Now, Patrice tells us that there is an ongoing trial in the U.S. It's called the Jenna Valve Align AR Pivotal Trial. Of course, it's not really a trial because there is no comparator and no blinding. I won't say much more here. This is the seems like the first 10K of a marathon when it comes to treating AI without surgery. And obviously, aortic regurgitation, aortic insufficiency is a tougher problem for transcatheter valves. But bioengineering is pretty amazing to watch. Final topic today is post-PCI antiplatelet therapy. Not every day. But many days, even in the EP clinic, the question of how best to keep stents from clotting off comes up. My friend, stents for STEMI is one of the cardiologist's greatest inventions, but there remains the challenge of keeping clots off these metal cages. EuroPCR had an interesting paper on shortening the course of dual antiplatelet therapy after stenting. Now, this whole concept is a bit like Icarus. You don't want to fly too close to the sun with antithrombotics, as bleeding will certainly cause bad outcomes. You want to prevent stents, but you want to do it with the least amount of uh, drug burden as possible. Master DAP, this was a trial that studied older patients who had high bleeding risk. The original trial, the main trial, was published in New England in October of 2021. The patients had 40% were stable angina, 25% non-STEMIs, 12% STEMIs, 11% unstable angina. So it was a mixed PCI group. 
The study used a biodegradable polymer seroluma saluting stent, which is not used in the U.S. And the two therapy options were abbreviated versus standard therapy DAPT after the PCI. Now, patients in this trial had to go one month after a PCI with no events, and so things happened at one month. They were then randomized to abbreviated, which meant going from DAP to single antiplatelet therapy. The other group, standard therapy, meant continued dual antiplatelet therapy for at least five additional months. That's six months after the PCI. Or for those patients who were receiving oral anticoagulants for at least two additional months, which was three months after the index procedure. And then both groups got continuation of single antiplatelet therapy thereafter. The master DAP trial had three ranked primary outcomes. First was a net adverse clinical events, NACE. That's death, MI, stroke, or major bleeding. The second outcome was MACE, which is a major adverse cardiac or cerebral events, death, MI, or stroke. And the third primary endpoint was bleeding. The first two were tested by non-inferiority, and the third, bleeding or safety, was tested for superiority, as it should be. The main trial found that one month of DAPT was non-inferior to the continuation of therapy for at least two additional months with regard to the occurrence of NACE and MACE. Abbreviated therapy also resulted in a lower incidence of major or clinically relevant non-major bleeding. Now, the most recent trial published in European Heart Journal and presented at EuroPCR considered the question of abbreviated DAPT in patients who had had complex PCI. Now, surely, goes the conventional thinking, those who have complex PCI, numerous vessels, numerous stents, etc., would benefit from a longer DAPT. And about a third of the 44 patients in the main trial had complex PCI. So now you see where this is going. They can do a comparison of outcomes for the two groups, those who had complex and non-complex PCI. And this was a pre-specified analysis, meaning that the authors planned to do this before the trial. And boom, the complexity of the PCI in these high bleeding risk patients did not matter. DAPT discontinuation was associated with similar NACE and MACE and lower bleeding rates compared with standard DAPT, regardless of PCI or patient complexity. Now, my comments briefly. The simple conclusion is that you're tempted to just make a simple shorter DAPT for any high bleeding risk patient. But my gosh, there are caveats, and many of them are captured so beautifully by journalist Sue Hughes. First, this was a special biodegradable drug-eluting stent not used in the U.S., so would the results be similar with a different stent? I don't know. Uh, there's also no universally accepted definition of complex PCI, so you know one person's complex PCI may not be another's. The non-inferiority margins here were wide, meaning there is great uncertainty. And finally, MasterDAP had small numbers of STEMI, so can we extrapolate this short dual antiplatelet course to STEMI patients? And MasterDAP used a lot of clopidogrel monotherapy rather than aspirin. So in the end, I'm still calling my interventional cardiology buds quite a bit, but it sure looks like less is more is proving its mettle once again in medicine. So that's it for this week in cardiology. Remember, next week is a holiday. Then we're back June 3rd. As always, I'm grateful that you listened. And remember, friends, if you like this podcast, please tell a friend, give us a rating, write us a one or two sentence review. These things go a long way to helping others find us. Until two weeks, this is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology. You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org, Medscape Cardiology. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape.